uh, who are joining from East Africa and uh, good morning to our colleagues who are joining from the United States. Uh, I'm welcoming you today to our session. This is a critical care medicine session and uh, we are going to be discussing on the issue of uh, oxygenation and ventilation. So today is uh, March 15th, 2021, and we are going to have a round table discussion for the frequently asked questions. And our lead panelists for today are going to be Dr. Anna Maria Crawford, uh, who is an anesthesiologist at the Stanford Global Anesthesia Division of uh, Global Health Equity. And also we have uh, Professor Pauline Banguti, anesthesiologist as well from the University of Rwanda. So our session uh, has uh, a few etiquette and housekeeping items. So remember that our programming is based on the foundation of love and respect. Please respond kindly rather than the act if you disagree with something. It is everyone's responsibility to keep this webinar a safe space. We will be using the chat function for question and answer at the bottom of the screen. Please send all questions through the chat box and feel free to introduce yourself. Please turn on your video position your webcam effectively to show your face if you're alone or to capture the whole group if you're in a group. If you have any IT issues, uh, send a message through the chat to tech support, Assist International. And also the session is being recorded and your attendance is a consent to be recorded. Please also be mindful of infection prevention and control and try to limit your numbers, the number of people joining if you're gathering from one place and also practice physical distancing. So after that, I would like to welcome Dr. Anna, our lead panelist, to take over the session. Dr. Anna, welcome. Thank you. I will, uh, be, we will also be, sorry, sorry, Dr. Anna for that. We will also be launching a poll at the beginning of this session before going forward, just to uh, capture some items before, before we go forward. So please rest. Uh, participate in the poll. Yeah, hello everyone. Maraho. Um, I'm not sure who is here from other countries. Um, so I'm Anna Crawford. I have um, worked in Rwanda um, every year for I think 11 years now. I am an anesthesiologist uh, and also trained in critical care medicine, so a specialist in both. Um, so know many people from Rwanda, and I'm happy to see some names I recognize in the uh, participant box. We have already over 40 participants, so I would love to see your camera on. Um, I will be asking questions throughout, so if you could type your answers into the chat box, that might be easier than everyone unmuting and speaking at the same time. So we'll use the chat box to, um, to interact with each other and periodically um, I'll stop and we'll go through the answers together. All the content that we will um, cover today can be found online. So all the slides, all the videos, everything that I show you will be online and you can access it anytime. So with that, I'm going to share my screen and show you where to find um, the information. So I'm going to put this into the chat box. Let me see how to find the chat box now. This is the link to this website. This is the Global Anesthesia and Critical Care Learning Resource Center. This is something that we built when uh, the pandemic started because travel was restricted and we still wanted to reach out to you, our students, and be able to create materials to help you with anesthesia, with critical care, and also with COVID-19. So if you go to this website, um, there are several courses. There's a COVID-19 course. There's an oxygen series course, which we've been running since the beginning of the pandemic. You can see over here, there is a fundamentals of critical care course. 
And then some other courses that are still in development, obstetrics, pediatrics, and regional anesthesia. Um, and we will also uh, eventually form a global health equity course. So today, because we're talking about oxygenation and ventilation, we're gonna go into the fundamentals of critical care course. Once inside the course, you can see several different modules. We have 19 different modules. And today we're actually gonna go into this case discussion because that's the format that I wanted to use with you to talk about oxygenation and ventilation. So we'll open that up. You can see that it asks you to sign in. Anyone can create an account. It's free, it's open access. All you have to do is, is create a new account. And you can see I already have an account and it remembers me. But to create a new account, you just click on this button here in the lower left hand, and that's how you will create a new account. Once you've created your account, you enter email and password, and then you can log in. So because I clicked on the oxygenation and ventilation module, it takes me directly there. You can see on the left, there's a navigation pane. So all those other modules are listed. And you can see we're down here in module 19 ICU case discussions. You can also see there are three tabs here. You can see the learners tab. So anyone who has signed up for this Fundamentals of Critical Care course is listed here. So you can actually reach out to other students, other physicians, other nurses that have signed up for this course, and you can send them a message. You can also start a question about anything that you see within the module. So you can communicate with others about topics within this, uh, within this course. So today we're gonna to talk about oxygenation and ventilation. Um, there's a lot of things to cover. Um, I want to first just um, read you our disclaimer. Uh, we are here to help you make the best decisions for your patients. We want to remind you though that the content um, of the Learning Resource Center serves to promote exchange of knowledge and experiences. Um, it's not intended to substitute your best clinical judgment and independent thinking. Um, we make every attempt to keep the information up to date, evidence-based, um, but information does change rapidly. That's definitely something we've learned with the pandemic is information evolves and changes. So we try to do the most up-to-date and accurate information for you. Our pledge to learners is that we will remain uh, free from conflicts of interest. We will never take money from advertisers or industry to offer you education. We think education should be free and open access for all. So our pledge is that we keep, um, keep education free and, uh, and free from uh, conflicts of interest. So with that, we'll start with our case discussion. So we'll start with the history of present illness. Um, Mr. S is a 68 year old man with a history of asthma, hypertension, and diabetes. He presents to the hospital with eight day history of shortness of breath. He tested positive for the SARS-CoV-2 three days ago, but at that time he was not hypoxic. Now he's presenting with worsening of his shortness of breath over the past 24 hours or day. On room air, his SpO2 is 89 to 90%. His temperature is 38.5. Heart rate is 99. His non-invasive blood pressure is 143 over 79, and his respiratory rate is 25. So he's presenting to the emergency room, and the emergency room physician has decided to admit him to the hospital ward. He's placed on oxygen by nasal cannula at six liters per minute and his SpO2 improves and now is 92 to 94%. His fever is treated with paracetamol, which we call acetaminophen. Um, his chest x-ray shows bilateral infiltrates and he started on dexamethasone six milligrams per day. Physical exam, so in general, he's in no acute distress. He's alert and oriented times four. I'm gonna read out all these abbreviations in case there's medical students with us because a lot of times we have to learn these abbreviations. So this is general, no acute distress, neuro, alert and oriented times four. H-E-E-N-T is head, ears, eyes, nose, throat. 
and it's normocephalic atraumatic. His mucous membranes are moist. His pupils are equal round reactive to light. His neck is supple and he has no lymphadenopathy. CV is cardiovascular. He has a regular rate and rhythm. You hear S1, S2 sounds and there are no murmurs, rubs, or gallops. Pulmonary, he has a normal work of breathing. He has clear breath sounds and no wheezing. Abdominal, soft, non-tender, non-distended, and positive bowel sounds. From musculoskeletal, he moves all of his extremities well and he does not have significant edema and his skin is intact, warm, and dry. Some investigations are sent. We call this a CBC, which is a complete blood count. I believe that uh, many of you call, also call it a full blood count and that is uh, found to be within normal limits. The BMP is our basic metabolic profile, also called a survey seven. And that's also within normal limits on this patient. The positive lab that's significant is SARS-CoV-2. Um, if you guys have questions along the way, just put them in the, in the chat box and I'll try. It's difficult sometimes when screen sharing to see the chat box, but I'll do my best to, um, to keep everything up. Um, so oftentimes when we are doing lectures, we have learning objectives. And I think it's important for us to not have learning objectives just in themselves, but to actually have practice change objectives. And the reason I call them practice change objectives is just because we learn the information doesn't mean that we know how to make the right decisions clinically. And even if we know how to make the right decisions clinically, that doesn't necessarily mean that we actually will take the action necessary for appropriate interventions. So I call the practice change objectives. I wanna maximize learning transfer, meaning that you, the learner, will actually not only learn the information and know what to do, but change the patient needs. So our practice change objectives today, the first Oh, must, okay, we'll keep that later. Okay. The first thing we will do is define hypoxemia. <clears throat> and what we will do is also distinguish between hypoxemia and hypoxia. I think this is important. This, this difference is important because it helps us recognize why we're doing things when we um, administer oxygen therapy and respiratory support. We want to define significant hypoxemia for different patient populations. Some patients can tolerate uh, lower oxygen levels than other patients. So we wanna understand what our targets are. How do, we, how do we know which patient populations are at higher risk or lower risk? The next section, we'll talk about oxygen therapy. We wanna know where our oxygen comes from. And then we also wanna know which devices are available to us to deliver oxygen to our patients who are hypoxic and need oxygen support. And so we want to appropriately prescribe oxygen therapy and devices for different types of patients. Not all patients are the same, as you know. We're going to define respiratory failure or respiratory failure, list the different types. So understanding the different types of respiratory failure is important, but what is probably more important is that we recognize it when we see it. So we'll talk about how to recognize respiratory failure in our patients. And then again, the action is to prescribe an intervention that's appropriate for the respiratory failure. Um, and then when I, we're supporting respiratory failure, it's probably even more important to recognize when what we have prescribed or the intervention that we have taken to support our patients is no longer working. So we really want to recognize when to escalate to higher levels of ventilatory care. And then we will talk about mechanical ventilation, which I, I believe is probably why a lot of people are here on this lecture. Mechanical ventilation is something as a student, you have to learn over and over and over again. And you have to really use it in your practice before you, before you fully understand um, mechanical ventilation. Um, and then additionally, the evidence and science changes around mechanical ventilation. And so it, it evolves as we learn more about 
the best way to care for our patients. So we'll, we'll talk about the basic modes of mechanical ventilation just to lay the foundation of understanding. And then we'll talk about different parameters on the mechanical ventilator. And then the big takeaways for you is to understand which parameters improve oxygenation and which parameters improve ventilation. Um, and then we want to understand when we look at these parameters, how do we know if our patient's getting, getting better? And then the last section, I'm just going to share with you some resources available online. They're open access, they're free, that I think are very helpful, especially when you're working clinically taking care of patients um, to uh, reference uh, if you have questions about mechanical ventilation or otherwise. So with that, we're going to start with our first section, defining hypoxemia. And for this section, um, we're gonna, we're gonna, again, we're gonna define hypoxemia, distinguish hypoxemia from hypoxia, and then define the different levels uh, for different patients. Um, before we dive into the lecture, I just want um, to see if you have any questions. If you have questions, I don't see any in the chat box, but you're, you're more than welcome to put them there. Okay, let me get rid of this. So I am use your chat box and I want to see you write the definition of hypoxemia versus hypoxia. So just try to tell me the difference uh, between the two and I'll give you about one minute. So I'd like to see a couple people try to define hypoxemia, try to define um, hypoxia. And then we'll talk a little bit more about the different ways to detect insufficient oxygenation. So we'll pull up our chat box and see what answers come out. If I don't see uh, people in the chat box, I will be inclined to start calling on names that I recognize. Let's see. I definitely know some of these people, so. Okay, we start to see. So the more you answer in the chat, chat box, the less likely I am to call on Jackson. I think I saw Benjamin. I think I saw Eric, Jean-Pierre, Angelique. I will call on you. So answer in the chat box and I won't call on you. <laughs> oh, good. We see some uh, answers coming in. Ten seconds. Okay, good. Um, yes, I was timing you. Okay, perfect. So let's go back through these chat chat answers. This is great. I love, love, love how interactive this is. Wonderful. Okay, hypoxemia is low oxygen levels in the tissues, or hypoxia is low oxygen levels in the tissues. Hypoxemia is low blood. Hypoxemia is low oxygen content in blood, whereas hypoxia is low oxygen content in the tissues. Perfect. Um, great. So the difference is, is the oxygen concentration in the blood versus the oxygen concentration in the tissues. So um, to answer these two questions, so all of these answers are very good. Thank you. Um, to answer these two questions, we're going to click on this resource. So this is something that you should know about the Learning Resource Center. When you see a question, an image, um, oftentimes you can click on it and it will take you to an article, a reference of some, so some sort. So when we click on this one, it's going to take us to a video. Diagnosing and treating hypoxemia requires providers understand its definition and how to detect hypoxemia using pulse oximetry or arterial blood gas analysis. When we breathe, we pull air into our lungs. Room air contains 21% oxygen. When oxygen enters our lungs, it travels to the alveoli where it diffuses from the alveoli into the pulmonary capillaries. 
oxygen then either binds to hemoglobin within the red blood cells or diffuses into the plasma. This is called oxygenation. Insufficient oxygenation is called hypoxemia. The rate at which oxygen is delivered to the cells and tissues of the body is known as oxygen delivery. Inadequate delivery of oxygen to the cells, tissues, and organs of the body is known as hypoxia. Every cell of the body requires oxygen for cellular metabolism. Lack of oxygen leads to cell death, tissue death, and organ dysfunction. The rate at which oxygen is removed from the blood and used by the cells and tissues is known as oxygen consumption. Oxygen in the blood can be detected a number of ways. The majority of oxygen is bound to hemoglobin. This is known as oxyhemoglobin. The saturation of hemoglobin can be detected directly using arterial blood gas analysis or can be detected indirectly using pulse oximetry. When oxyhemoglobin is measured by arterial blood gas analysis, it is termed SAO2. When oxyhemoglobin is measured using pulse oximetry, it is termed SPO2. The small portion of oxygen that dissolves into the plasma creates an arterial oxygen tension or partial pressure and is known as PAO2. Pulse oximeters measure arterial oxygen saturation, termed SPO2. Hemoglobin bound to oxygen is termed oxyhemoglobin. Hemoglobin not bound to oxygen is termed deoxyhemoglobin. Pulse oximeters shine light through tissue beds, usually a finger, a toe, or an earlobe. Then they measure the amount of light that is absorbed. Oxyhemoglobin absorbs light at a different wavelength than does deoxyhemoglobin. The ratio of light absorbed by oxyhemoglobin versus the light absorbed by deoxyhemoglobin is displayed as a percentage by the pulse oximeter. Non-pulsatile venous blood and tissues also absorb light. However, these components are discarded by the pulse oximeter. The pulse oximeter only uses the values obtained from pulsatile arterial blood flow. Normal oxygen saturation by pulse oximetry is greater than 94%. However, when administering oxygen therapies, an SpO2 greater than 90% is usually acceptable. Pulse oximetry is non-invasive and painless for patients. Arterial blood gas analysis termed ABG directly measures arterial blood gases, oxygen, and carbon dioxide. Values obtained from ABGs include the pH, the partial pressure of oxygen termed PaO2, arterial oxygen saturation or SaO2, the partial pressure of carbon dioxide termed PaCO2, bicarbonate and base excess. Blood gas analysis requires a blood sample from the patient, which can be painful. Okay, um, so we defined hypoxemia as um, insufficient oxygenation. So lack of oxygen in the blood, whether it's partial pressure of oxygen or bound to hemoglobin. And we defined hypoxia as insufficient um, oxygen delivery to cells and tissues. And so I think it's really important to understand those differences because when we are treating our patients, we more often than not are measuring um, oxygen in the blood, which doesn't tell us about the actual delivery of oxygen to the tissues. Um, I saw some really great answers about the two ways to detect insufficient oxygenation. We use pulse oximetry and arterial blood gas analysis. And we'll talk a little bit more about 
about um, how do you use pulse oximetry for making diagnoses and treating patients, especially in gas analysis, which is, which is common everywhere. So the next thing I wanted to share with you, which I think is a great resource, um, is this diagram. And you can see here, this is the web Website. Um, it's called differentialdiagnosisof.com or ddxof.com. And so if you type in hypoxia or hypoxemia in that website, it gives you this really great um, graphic about the differences between hypoxemia and um, hypoxia. So I'm going to make it a little bit larger so we can see. So you can see in here at the top, the red box says hypoxemia, and at the bottom is hypoxia. Here shows a, um, an a collection of three uh, segments of alveoli. So you can see the conducting airway um, down into the respiratory segments and you have alveoli and capillaries surrounding it. And those numbers correspond to the numbers above, which is the level, anatomic level at which these problems can occur. So hypoxemia again is decreased oxygen um, into the blood. So the one, the first reason that can happen is there's not enough oxygen coming into the alveolus. So you can see that even coming into um, the respiratory components of the lung, there's not any oxygen coming in. And this can happen in a couple different ways. One way is low FiO2. This can happen at high altitudes. So our colleagues in Peru, Tibet, Ethiopia that live at high altitude, they actually have a lower fraction of inspired oxygen just because they live at altitude. So that can lead to hypoxemia, um, which worsens with uh, pathophysiologic conditions. The second reason you can have a low amount of oxygen coming in is the patient's not breathing or hypoventilation. And some of those causes is, uh, include CNS depression. So we give, um, sorry, we give medications. The patient has a traumatic brain injury or a stroke and it, it affects their respiratory drive. So hypoventilation can lead to um, lack of breathing, which means the patient's not pulling oxygen into their lungs. You can also have neuromuscular problems or chest wall problems that affect ventilation. So that's one of the uh, first reasons why hypoxemia can occur. Another reason is diffusion problem. So you bring oxygen in and it goes into the alveolus, but it doesn't cross from the inside of the alveolus across that cell membrane, across the interstitium, and then into the capillary. And so those are diffusion problems. And they happen when you have any sort of um, edema or inflammation or scarring within those parts of the lungs. So if you have alveolar uh, scarring, al alveolar fluid, if you have interstitial scarring or fluid. So for pathology, pulmonary fibrosis, interstitial lung disease, emphysema, pulmonary vasculitis, all of these can lead to diffusion problems and hypoxemia. Okay, the third is oxygen binding. So this means the oxygen comes in, it goes to the alveolus, it's actually transferred to the capillary, but it doesn't bind to hemoglobin. And an example of that would be carbon monoxide poisoning. And then our favorite topic is VQ mismatch, um, which is the fourth reason listed for hypoxemia. Um, and as we all know, VQ mismatch can, can apply to dead space or shunt. So the typical examples of dead space, COPD, pulmonary embolus, um, and typical examples of shunt can be um, intracardiac or within the lung. Um, also things that prevent ventilation. So pneumonia, atelectasis, pulmonary edema, and ARDS can all cause shunt. Can someone tell me, this is time for entering answers into a chat box again. When we talk about VQ mismatch, so we talk about dead space and shunt. What is the definition of dead space and what is the definition of shunt? There's, there's a way that I remember these two. Um, but I'm hoping that you, uh, you can type those answers. The, what is um, the classic definition of dead space and what is a classic definition of shunt?
Hello, Benjamin. Thank you for your answers. Benjamin says ventilation without perfusion and Shunch says perfusion without ventilation, which is exactly the way I remember it too. It might be the way you remember it too, because I think at one point I was your teacher. So I love to see your answer. So thank you for that. Okay, so those are all reasons why we have insufficient oxygen in the blood or hypoxemia. We mentioned hypoxia is inadequate delivery of oxygen to cells and tissues. And so hypoxemia can occur with anemia, ischemia, or hist for histotoxic reasons. Histotoxic reasons is, is cyanide poisoning, which is fairly rare. And I wanna mention anemia. Anemia has to be very, very severe for you to detect it by pulse oximetry or ABG, but it can, if, if very severe, affect oxygen delivery to tissues. So uh, sometimes people may think that if somebody's very anemic and hypoxemic, that they should transfuse them and, and, or, they're, or they're hypoxic because of anemia. And I just want to point out that that is incredibly rare. And so transfusion is a whole different lecture, but we don't transfuse for hypoxemia. We transfuse for anemia that is significant. And when we're talking about ICU patients, uh, there's good evidence, which we can, again, if we have another lecture can talk about, but the, the evidence is that you really don't transfuse patients unless their hemoglobin is less than seven. Um, and that's in the, in the situation that they don't have ongoing bleeding. If they have ongoing bleeding, obviously you would, you would continue to transfuse. But just so you know, anemia is, not, is, is very rarely the cause of a low SpO2 reading. So the, the main reason we have hypoxia is because the blood doesn't, the blood doesn't get the oxygen to, to the cells and tissues. And so this can happen in, in shock states. Um, so, so CHF, septic shock of any sort, hypovolemic shock. Um, and then it can also happen locally. So that's a, a more systemic level. It can also happen locally at um, the level of the cells and tissues if you have obstruction in your arteries. So I'm seeing a lot of uh, chat answers here or questions. So let's go ahead and look through these. Thank you. All those answers came in about dead space is ventilation without perfusion and shunt is perfusion without ventilation. That's wonderful. I think it's also important to recognize with um, dead space um, and uh, shunt that that can happen at, at the level of the entire lung or a segment of lung or also an individual small segment. So. All right, let's keep going on past this. So the next thing um, is something for you to also answer in the chat box. So I want you to list the SpO2 goal for most patients, the SpO2 goal for pregnant patients, the SpO2 goal for patients in shock, and the SpO2 goal for COPD. And when I say goal, I want the lowest limit you would allow and the upper limit. So um, go ahead and start popping those in the chat box. And, um, and I'll, I'll give you a, a minute to answer these questions and I'll watch your answers. Okay, so this is um, this is actually a difficult question, and I, I see some answers coming in, and some of them are uh, different from e from each other. So we'll go ahead and just dive into the answers, and I think this is a really important um, question for a couple of reasons. One. Um, Historically, when people have become hypoxemic, we just put oxygen on them and we give them a bunch of oxygen and we assume we're doing a good thing. But 
what's discussed less often is that we can actually cause harm by giving too much oxygen. It's called hyperoxia. So we'll talk a little bit about that. But first, I want to share this resource with you. Um, this is a has a wall chart that you can print out and hang in your in your intensive care unit or your emergency department or wherever oxygen therapy is being given, even on the floor or on the ward. Um, and this was developed by several um, really experienced and knowledgeable groups, including the World Federation of Societies of Anesthesiologists or the WFSA. And so I think some of the, the key points is how to detect hypoxemia. And, and so for most people, if, if the SpO2 drops below 90%, that's when you start oxygen, okay? And you, you, we'll talk about different ways to deliver oxygen to your patients, but, but that's for most patients. Um, and so you want to target your SpO2 greater than 90% for adults and children. We're talking mostly about adults today because I'm an, an adult intensivist. Um, we do have a, a session coming up on pediatrics uh, next month for our, as part of our oxygen and critical care series. So if you want to really get into pediatrics, we'll talk about that next month. Um, if the patient has shock or altered mental status, um, they, they say that you should actually target an SpO2 grade, greater than 94%. And then in pregnant patients, you should really target um, greater than 92%. So this is how they start their algorithm with confirming the hypoxemia. They do talk about the different delivery devices and FiO2s that you can achieve, which we'll talk a little bit more about. And then you can see who the authors are. Um, and their references. And the very last page of this document is the thing that you can print out and hang. It's an algorithm on how to deliver oxygen to hypoxemic patients. So this may be helpful to um, providers that don't normally deal with hypoxemia, um, nurses, students, et cetera. So that's a good resource. Um, so for most patients, we want to we want to target greater than 90% pregnant patients or, preg or shock patients, you might want to do 92 to 94%. And then COPD, we um, typically will target uh, greater than 88. So those were some good answers. Let me see if I can um, read the rest of your answers. Great. So the numbers are different in all of these answers, and it and it is um, uh, it is a little bit different. So um, even Benjamin says all patients greater than ninety four percent. Ninety four percent is is actually what's considered normal, but that doesn't necessarily mean that's what we target um, when we're giving oxygen therapy. Um, and so the next question that leads us to our next question, is, which is: Is there a problem with giving? too much oxygen, yes or no? And I think I've already told you the answer. Yeah, so there is a problem with giving too much oxygen, isn't there? Oh, sorry. Keep clicking that, don't I? Everyone agrees. We don't wanna to give too much oxygen. So let's see if we have evidence for that. So here is an article. So again, in the Learning Resource Center, let me go back. If you see a question box, an image, whatever, you can always try to click on it and there may be something hiding behind it, which is um, a good resource. We oui, uh, got some French speakers out there. Je n'en comprends pas. Okay. So this article um, says harmful effects of hyperoxia in post cardiac arrest, sepsis, traumatic brain injury, and stroke. And I think this patient population is really important important because these are um, critically ill patients that we may actually tend to want to give them um, more oxygen. So that's the first thing I wanted to point out about this article. The second thing I want to point out about this article is the first author is Jean-Louis Vincent, who is basically like a godfather in critical care. So he's very well known, um, very uh, accomplished scientist and researcher in uh, sepsis and, and most critical care um, topics. And so I don't wanna read the whole article to you, but I do wanna point out uh, this one image which has um, PaO2 and you can see in millimeters of mercury and then um, this uh, graph that shows worse outcomes. And so 
in between these levels, 150 to around 350, 400, you actually might have some benefit. But if your oxygen levels get too low, then you see tissue hypoxia, you see a stress response or an adrenergic response, pulmonary hypertension. So that's when oxygen levels get too low. But you also have worse outcomes when oxygen levels get too high. Vasoconstriction, oxidative stress, cell death or apoptosis, and pulmonary damage. So when we're treating our hypoxemic patients, giving too much oxygen can be detrimental as can giving too little. So that's the, the most important thing to recognize. So formation of reactive oxygen radicals, perfect. Yes, destroys alveoli, absolutely. Good answers. Okay, what about patients with stroke, heart attacks and critically ill surgery patients? So what are our targets there? Um, I'm going to go ahead and just show you this. Um, so again, I click on the box and it takes me to a really no nice article or reference source. And so I'm going to show you this. I'm going to close our chat box here. This uh, really great article, it's more of a practice guideline. So it kind of tells you how, how to give the oxygen and to what targets you should be aiming. And this was in the uh, British Medical Journal. And it's called Oxygen Therapy for Acutely Ill Medical Patients, a Clinical Practice Guideline. And they basically took a lot of articles, a lot of literature and um, research, and they read through it and tried to make recommendation, clinical recommendations based on all of these studies. And so they, made, they came away with three recommendations. The first is to stop oxygen therapy um, no higher than 96%. So that's a strong, you can see the evidence is strong for that, that if you have a patient on oxygen and their SpO2 reads 96, you don't have to give them more oxygen. So the, base, the, the basic premise is that you don't have to target 100% SpO2, that 96 is really a great goal for the high end of, of oxygen, uh, oxygenation. Their second recommendation, which you can see says weak, is so when you have weak evidence, oftentimes it, it, it turns into expert opinion. So at weak, it, they suggest that not starting oxygen therapy between 90 to 92 percent saturation. So if your patient is satting or has an SpO2 of 90, 90 to 92 on their own on room air, you don't necessarily need to start oxygen. So it's really less than 90 percent is when you would start oxygen. The third recommendation, which is also strong, says do not start oxygen therapy at or above 93. So your patient should really have a lower oxygen saturation before you um, start oxygen therapy. So then the next three pictures are these three recommendations broken down into more detail. So the recommendation one says they compared keeping a higher oxygen level versus a lower oxygen level. They reviewed all of it and they said they recommend oxygen saturation between, be maintained no higher than 96%. And so if you wanna see the evidence and the studies that they looked at, you can click on this more details and it'll go through and list all the different studies. You can go through these and look at all the different studies they used. So the big takeaway from this um, clinical practice guideline is that you don't have to, if your oxygen saturations are 100%, you can probably wean down your oxygen because 96 is good enough. And then um, don't necessarily need to start oxygen unless your patient sats are less than 90%. So that's, that's the big takeaway um, from these recommendations. I'm just gonna check the chat box and see if you guys have any questions. Uh, thank you, Sarah. So Sarah is also sharing some of these links in the chat box in case you don't have um, an account on the LRC just yet. Yes, so Dr. Saria is asking if we can talk about oxygen when you don't have ABGs, and of course I will be getting to that. Perfect. So monitoring oxygen and uh, settings without ABG. Yep, absolutely. That's definitely part of this discussion. Um, let me go back. Okay, so this first part, as you remember, was um, about oxygenation. And so now what we will do is talk about oxygen therapy. So remember, we talked about hypoxemia, 
And now we're going to go into oxygen therapy. So this will answer the last two questions in the chat box about um, how do we actually deliver oxygen therapy. And I think it's really important when we talk about oxygen therapy for hypoxemia is to understand where our oxygen actually comes from and to identify what's available in our facilities. So do we have ABG? Do we not have ABG? What type of oxygen supply do we have? What type of delivery devices do we have? And so that will help us help guide us in which types of oxygen um, prescriptions to write for our patients. So oxygen, I think, is really important for us to realize is like any other medication. You really should be explicit in your orders in the chart about how the nurses should administer oxygen to these patients. What parameters? Uh, what are the goals, how many liters per minute, and which device should be used. You can't just write give oxygen because the nurses may not know um, the proper way to do so. Uh-oh, we have a case update on Mr. S. Suddenly your student calls you and says, I think something's wrong with the patient. I hear an alarm. You can see that we can click on this. So this is a challenge for you. So get your chat box ready. Can you interpret this SpO2 tracing? What is the heart rate? What is the SpO2? Put your answers in the chat box. Which is the SpO2 and which is the heart rate? Okay, I'm going to stop the video and watch the chat box here. And we can replay this video. Can you interpret this SpO2 tracing? What is the heart rate? Ooh, I like some of these answers. What is the SpO2? Okay, so we'll go ahead and do the answer, but recognize that some of these activities on the Learning Resource Center are interactive for you. So if this were you on the Learning Resource Center, you can see that we have an 83 and a 55. So I'm going to guess that 83 is supposed to represent the SpO2 and 55 because you can hear you can also hear the, uh, the pulse oximeter. I'm gonna guess that 55 is supposed to represent the heart rate. So let's click on the 83. The SpO2 is displayed as 83%. However, the waveform is uneven and inconsistent. If the waveform is not good, then values displayed by the pulse oximeter are inaccurate and unreliable. Try repositioning the probe cover the probe from ambient light or move to an extremity with better perfusion. So even though your pulse oximeter says 83%, you can see this waveform is not reliable. It, it doesn't correspond to the patient's pulse. If you click on the 55, it says the same thing. This is the heart rate, it's displayed at 55, but you can't trust it because the waveform is no good. So some people picked up on that in the chat box, which is excellent. And, and the importance of this activity is for you to recognize how to trust the data. Because if this is no good, 83, and you then intubate your patient, you're actually doing your patient a huge disservice and potentially harm because this act number is actually inaccurate. So you shouldn't make clinical decisions on bad data. And so that's the point of knowing how to interpret your SpO2 tracing. So thank you for those chat box answers. That was really, really good. Okay. So you tell your medical student, put it on the finger, tell the patient to stop moving their hand. The waveform comes back to normal. The SpO2 is stable. And then you go back to your, to your day and you teach your medical student how to interpret SpO2. Okay. What are the different options for oxygen supply? So I'm not talking about oxygen mass. So I'm talking about where does oxygen come from? So in your chat box, tell me the different types of oxygen supply there are, and then which options are available in your facility, if you can.
where does oxygen come from for our medical facilities? I'll put the timer on again. We'll give you a minute. Concentrators, cylinders, H and E cylinders, good. Liquid oxygen. Concentrators, good. Cylinders, good. Good. Okay. Pipeline oxygen, that's, that's something we should talk about. Okay, I think that's enough time. Those are very um, good answers. Jean Lenard, Lenard just uh, raised his hand. So let's see if we can figure out how, <laughs> how to find Jean Lenard. Okay, let's finish this topic and then we'll stop screen sharing and we'll have a discussion. But first I want you to see the different types of oxygen supply. Um, I'll make this a little bit bigger. If we can, oops, no, I'm clicking on things again. Okay, so you can see here is a liquid oxygen tank. It's in a fenced area. This is actually a picture of one of the hospitals in, in which I work where they have a large oxygen tank in the back of the hospital. There's a chocolate factory behind it. The hospital is actually over here in front, but a liquid oxygen tank. These are H or J cylinders. Um, and we had mentioned that, that oxygen is often comes from pipelines. Pipelines are what is built into hospital walls or um, in, into the wards. And so you can have pipeline oxygen, but it can come from a liquid oxygen tank or from, from cylinders. Many of you have seen these, these are oxygen concentrators. And then finally, we can also have these really large oxygen plants and they put oxygen on trucks either in a, a, a cylinder or they put the liquid oxygen in a truck and then they, they truck the oxygen and they fill the liquid oxygen tank or they drop off the, the cylinders. So oxygen comes from diff many different places. At an oxygen plant, there's different types of ways to produce oxygen. There's cryogenic liquid oxygen and there's also something called uh, pressure swing absorption where they remove the nitrogen out of the air that leaves mostly oxygen. So similar to an oxygen uh, concentrator. Um, I'm gonna stop screen sharing for just a minute so I can see all of your beautiful faces um, and look at the, the chat box. Okay, wonderful. So Jean Lenard can't see the screen. Can everyone else see the screen? The share when I share my screen? You can un unmute yourself, I think. Hello, everyone. <laughs> yes. No, no. Okay, so most people are able to see the screen, it seems, it seems huh? Yes. So maybe Jean Lenard having some technical face? difficulties on, on his side. What questions do you guys have so far? Everything is clear. Okay. Okay, perfect, perfect. Okay, so text support says if you're on your phone and you cannot see the screen, then try to swipe left or right on your phone and, um, and you might be able to, um, to see it then. Okay. Well, we will go back and continue the um, information on the Learning Resource Center. I have a great question from someone, Techno CM. I think that might not be their name. That might be the name of their phone. But um, how does an co oxygen concentrator work? Does anybody know? Can you type it in the chat box? How does an oxygen concentrator work?
I'm actually going to try to pull up a really great video of oxygen concentrators. And so when I screen share again, I will be able to show you this. Um, okay. Okay, so I'm gonna go back. Okay, so someone says oxygen concentrator produces oxygen um, itself with a system of zeolite, but it's zeolite with an L. It has a certain metal which traps all elements and allows oxygen. Okay, perfect. I'm gonna screen share again. Um, I'm gonna screen share my desktop so it might get a little messy, apologies. Um, Okay, so how does an oxygen concentrator work? I wanna show you this really fun, um, it's a GIF actually, but oxygen concentrators pull room air in through a filter inside the machine. And then there's a compressor and a heat exchanger, and then it pushes under pressure um, that air through what are called molecular sieve beds. And within these sieve beds are components called zeolite. And zeolite adamantly binds to nitrogen. And so it takes the nitrogen out of the air, leaving only the oxygen. And the oxygen is then put into a tank and then that's how the oxygen comes out to the patient. Room air, this says 80% nitrogen and 20% oxygen. That's not actually true because oxygen is 21% and nitrogen is uh, upper 70s. So there's a couple other elements in the air. But for the most part, if you have primarily nitrogen and you, you take all the nitrogen out by these sieve beds and zeolite, then you leave almost pure oxygen up to 90 to 95% um, oxygen. So that's how oxygen concentrators work. Um, very interesting. And that's a similar concept, but on a very large scale for pressure swing absorption, adsorption uh, facilities, 78 and 21. Perfect. Thank you. thought it was 78, but I wasn't positive, so I didn't say. Okay. Here's another challenge for you. Rank the following oxygen delivery devices in order from least FiO2 delivered to highest FiO2 delivered. And I'll try to make this a little bit bigger so you can see. Number one, number two, number three, and number four go from least to most FiO2. This is a, an, an oxygen mask with a reservoir bag. This is a nasal cannula. This is a simple mask. And this is a Venturi mask with valves. I'll give you just a few more seconds to answer. Put them in order. One, two, three, four, one, four, three, two, one, two, four, three. How, how what order? Least to highest. Two, three, four, one seems like the most popular answers. So let's, um, again, we can click on um, the question. Whoops, I don't know where that went, sorry. Click on the question and we can get the answer, get the resource. So this actually takes us to um, another part of the Learning Resource Center that talks about oxygen delivery devices and um, oxygen concentration. So we'll start with the nasal prong. Nasal prongs can be used in adults or children. You can see this is a really important point that there are flow limitations to each of these devices. So nasal prongs or nasal cannulas really should, uh, the low end should be 0.5 and the high end should be somewhere between four to six liters per minute. If you give more than that, you're just wasting oxygen. The FiO2 that can be delivered with nasal prongs is 28% to 40% at the high end. So 40 is the highest you, you can hope to achieve with a nasal cannula or nasal prongs. 
we'll skip over the nasal pharyngeal catheter that's used in infants and go to the simple face mask. Again, it can be used in adults or children. Six to 10 liters is what you should run when using a face mask. And the highest you can achieve is 60%. Let's talk a little bit more about the mask with the reservoir bag. This can again be used in adults or children. Children And when you use the mask with the reservoir bag, sometimes called a non rebreather, you really should be using flows between 10 to 15 liters per minute. It's not designed to have um, deliver high oxygen at flows lower than that. So the fraction of inspired oxygen can actually get as high as 95% with a non rebreather. You can see on the device, the oxygen tubing comes in and oxygen can go, can go down towards the bag or it can go up towards the patient's nose. And right at the bottom of the patient's nose, this inlet here has a little, um, a small valve. So when you first turn on the oxygen to the non-rebreather, you should turn it on at, at least 10 liters per minute. And what you can do is put your finger over that valve. It'll close off the upper side of this um, tube. And so the oxygen will all go down and fill that bag. Once that bag is filled, you can take your finger off the valve and put the mask on the patient. And you can see when the patient breathes in, they'll pull in oxygen from the tubing, but also from this oxygen reservoir bag, which is 100% oxygen. They can pull in ambient air through some holes in the mask, but they will get high levels of oxygen with the reservoir bag. The reason I'm spending so much time on the non-rebreather reservoir bag oxygen mask is because it's the highest level of oxygen that you can deliver using a low flow device. The next device is Venturi. You can see these different um, filter or uh, valves that you can attach. So the oxygen tubing attaches to one of these little valves. The valve plugs into some corrugated tubing and it goes up to the mask. The size of these different colored, different colored valves are different sizes and allow more or less entrainment of, of air. And so that can determine how much FiO2 you can give. And so you can get anywhere from 24 to 60% there. I'm gonna go back to the chat because it's blowing up. Lots of questions, it seems. Okay, oh, that, those are those other old answers, perfect, okay. So we'll close this and go back to our question. So I would say the answer, the least amount is definitely the nasal cannula. The highest amount is definitely the oxygen mask with the reservoir bag. The simple mask and Venturi can both get up to around 60% FiO2. So it really depends on whether or not you have the green valve. The green valve gives you the highest level of oxygen. Okay, now we're going to go to respiratory failure, which is the next segment of the discussion. Our practice change objectives here, we want to list the types of respiratory failure. Again, it's really important that we not only know the types, but that we recognize it when we see it so that we can appropriately intervene. And then if we do intervene and support the patient, we want to make sure that it's working and we want to recognize when it's not working. So respiratory failure is very common um, and we see it all the time. And there's different ways to support patients in respiratory failure. Okay, we have a clinical case update. Mr. S, if you remember, is on oxygen by nasal cannula at six liters per minute. Unfortunately, his SpO2 drops. It's now 87% which by all evidence is too low. <laughs> and his respiratory rate has increased to 32 breaths per minute. So Mr. S is not doing very well. Another question for you, let's get you to answer this one. Which of the following statements about respiratory failure is incorrect? So which of these is not true? Respiratory failure is a failure of gas exchange, either oxygenation or carbon dioxide elimination. Respiratory failure can be acute or chronic. Respiratory failure is a syndrome, not a disease. Respiratory failure usually resolves on its own. Patients in respiratory failure have tachypnea, hypoxemia, and hypercapnia. Which of the following is incorrect? I'm going to give you one minute. 
Here goes the chat box. I love it. Thank you for your answers. Whoa, everybody agrees. Respiratory failure does not resolve on its own. A patient in respiratory failure needs your help. Very good. But if D is incorrect, that means all these other answers are correct. So respiratory failure is defined um, as a failure of gas exchange. You're not getting enough oxygen in, you're not getting enough carbon dioxide out. It can be acute or it can be chronic. It's a syndrome, it's not a disease. That respiratory failure is a syndrome of something else. You have to figure out what the disease is or what the cause is, and that's how you treat respiratory failure. You can, all the other things we do support patients, but you really need to be able to treat the underlying cause. Respiratory failure, uh, patients may have tachypnea or fast breathing. They may have hypoxemia and they may have, have hypercapnia. Oftentimes they have all three. Okay, this is my favorite thing to do uh, with students. I want everyone, I'm gonna stop sharing. Everybody, take a big deep breath and blow it out. Yeah, there you go. The Jacksons are taking deep breaths, I see them. Big deep breath. Okay, you are when you take a big deep breath, you're activating your diaphragm. Your diaphragm is going down. Your chest wall is expanding. That pulls your lungs apart. You're creating negative pressure in your chest and you're pulling air into your lungs. You're pulling oxygen from the air, that 21% oxygen into your lungs. When you exhale, all of that recoils and your lungs just push that breath back out. You're getting rid of all of your carbon dioxide, aren't you? It also feels good to take a big deep breath. So, okay, let's go back and watch this video and breathe with the video. When you breathe in, air enters your nose or mouth and passes into your trachea or windpipe. At the carina, the trachea divides into two bronchi then branches into smaller bronchioles. The bronchioles end in tiny air sacs or alveoli. Here, the oxygen in the air you inhale passes into the bloodstream and carbon dioxide from your body passes out of the bloodstream. The carbon dioxide is expelled from your body when you exhale. Very easy, very simple, very fundamental. We all know these things. So if that's how we breathe and that's why we breathe, what are the types of respiratory failure, acute respiratory failure? There's a potential for four answers. So in the chat box, put as many as you, as you can. What are the four types of acute respiratory failure? <clears throat> Perfect, hypoxemic has come up. Hypercarbic, good. We're talking about respiratory failure, not cardiovascular failure. So what types of respiratory failure? Hypoxemic, hypercarbic, perfect. We'll go ahead and stop there and move on. Those, and mix, thank you. <laughs> Those are the most common. So if you click on this, this is a resource for residents that are rotating through critical care, rotating through the ICU at McGill. So this is free and online. Oops, sorry, I went to McGill University. And I liked the way they categorize their respiratory failure. So they define four types of respiratory failure, but let's start with the definition. The loss of the ability to ventilate adequately or provide sufficient oxygenation or oxygen to the blood and systemic organs. The pulmonary system is no longer able to meet the metabolic demands of the body with respect to oxygenation of the blood or CO2 elimination. 
So that, de that de definition is very thorough. Um, and so it, it, it implies we can have problems with oxygen or problems with carbon dioxide and also with metabolic demand, <clears throat> excuse me. So type one is also called hypoxemic respiratory failure. Type two is called hypercapnic respiratory failure. Type one and type two is what most people answered in the chat box, hypoxemic and hypercapnic. And that's what we talk about mostly. I have to admit, I've never really talked about type three or type four, and I don't think about them very often, but sometimes you may hear people talk about type three or type four, um, which is perioperative or shock. So not something that I typically think about or teach. We, I mostly talk about hypoxemic, hypercarbic, or mixed. So four types, just so you know, there are four types of respiratory failure that you may see people discuss. What type of respiratory failure does Mr. S have? What type of respiratory failure, failure does our patient have? So most of you are saying type one, and I would agree. We definitely know that Mr. S is hypoxemic. So hy hypoxemic respiratory failure is both the Jacksons agree. Um, type one is definitely present. The thing we don't know is his carbon dioxide levels because we haven't checked an arterial blood gas. So he could potentially have type two or a mixed respiratory failure, but type one is definitely the right answer. We would have to check um, an arterial blood gas to see our PaCO2 in order to determine if he's also retaining carbon dioxide. So type one is what I would say. The next thing I wanna see in the chat box is the answer to this uh, challenge, list some signs and symptoms of respiratory failure. So this is respiratory failure in adults. And in the chat box, I want you to put signs and or symptoms. And just to remind you, um, and help your memory, I'll let you watch this video while you type. Signs and symptoms of respiratory failure. Okay. Starting to see the answers come in. We're looking for signs and symptoms of respiratory failure. Perfect. So difficult breathing, um, definitely, but um, it would be great to know, how would you describe the difficulty in breathing? Would it be that the patient's breathing fast? Would it be that they're using accessory muscles? Is it because they can't speak in full sentences? Is it because like in this video, you can see the use of accessory muscles. You can see that he's laboring to breathe. He's using his abdomen. He has intercostal recession and nasal flaring. We can't see this gentleman's nose because he's actually on a non-invasive positive pressure ventilation mask. But dyspnea is a sensation. That's what the patient will describe. I To say I have shortness of breath means I'm dyspneic. Tacky or uh, um, brady, so breathing too quickly or too slowly. We usually don't see people breathe too slowly unless they're at the very end stage of failure, meaning that they're obtunded, they've received medications. So someone who's still awake and struggling will often breathe more quickly. Um, all of these are perfect answered, altered mental status, fast breathing, beautiful, all very good answers. So let's watch this video one more time. You can see 
He's retracting intercostally. You can see his sternum move in while his abdomen moves out. He's really trying to open up his lungs. He's breathing quickly. If you count, he breathes 32 times in this 54 second video. Look at his neck. See how he's trying to pull his lungs open using his accessory muscles? This guy is very, uh, very short of breath. He's tachypnic, he's struggling, he has an increased work of breathing. The one other thing you should recognize about that video is that he's still awake and he is, um, he is compliant or allowing that face mask. So um, we'll talk a little bit about non-invasive positive pressure ventilation, but it's important to realize that's often difficult to tolerate that, that high pressure in your face. Um, and also it's not to be used when people are obtunded or not um, initiating breaths on their own. So all your answers are perfect. Those are really, really good. Okay, we have another case update. What's going on with Mr. S? He is placed on oxygen using a mask with a reservoir bag. We like that because reservoir bags can get your FiO2 up to 90 to 90%, we decided. And the flow is 10 to 15 liters per minute and his provider decided to put him on 15 liters per minute. So all of that is appropriate. Uh-oh, unfortunately his oxygen remains at 86 to 89% and his respiratory rate is 32 breaths per minute. Remember when we started, we wanted to make sure that we recognize how to start appropriate interventions, but also how to recognize when our interventions are failing. So we talked about the non-rebreather mask or the reservoir bag being the highest level of oxygen that you can deliver using a low flow device. So he's on the highest amount of oxygen we can give him at using just oxygen. So he's on a reservoir bag at 15 liters per minute. You can't get any higher than that with your low flow devices. Yet he is still failing. His saturation is too low and his respiratory rate is too high. So he needs more help. You have to recognize this uh, when it happens because you, it's your job to escalate that care, okay? So should Mr. S be transferred to the ICU? Yes or no? And why? Tell me why. What is the indication or to transfer to the ICU? And if you don't want to send them to the ICU, why not? Absolutely, yes. Why or why not? Yes, yes, yes. Pourquoi? Good, Dr. Saria nailed it. May need a higher level of support, high flow oxygen or mechanical support, may need intubation, great. Some of the other answers are correct, but not exact, such as he's hypoxic. Do all hypoxic patients need to come to ICU? Not necessarily, but if, if they may need a higher level of care or a higher level of monitoring. So the other reason to transfer people to ICU is because you have more nurses, um, and you also have greater ability to monitor. You have continuous monitoring instead of intermittent monitoring. Um, uh, he may need a high flow or intubation, which we'll talk about more. So I would, I would agree that um, Joshua, close monitoring and respiratory support, that's a perfect answer right there, perfect. Okay, so he needs to go to the intensive care unit. I'm not gonna go into great detail about the indications for ICU admission, <clears throat> but if you click on that question box, it will take you to several resources that discuss how to triage, admit, and discharge patients to and from the intensive care unit. So each one of these, this is an article and another article, and this is um, some guidelines. So if you wanna read more about 
when to admit patients to the ICU, when to discharge patients to the IC, from the ICU, and how to triage patients. These are some great resources. So we, we all agree he should go to ICU because he needs more monitoring and he may need more respiratory support. Um, what is the most likely diagnosis? What do you think is happening? What diagnosis would you make in Mr. S? Yeah, Dr. Banguti says P to F ratio less than 200. This is because Dr. B Banguti's mind is, is faster than ours and way before ours. We actually don't have an, an ABG yet. So we don't know the PAO2. So we can't calculate the F, uh, P to F ratio yet, but we'll get there. Mm, techno, I like it. Techno CM. What is Techno's name? Because I don't think that's the real name. Acute respiratory failure, good. ARDS, good, Jackson. I want to know who Techno CM is. <laughs> Put that in the chat box. Okay, ARDS, perfect, perfect, Sadiq. Okay, so the most likely diagnosis, everyone thinks it's ARDS. So let's click on the box to get the answer. We also, I also agree that it's acute res respiratory distress syndrome. So acute respiratory distress syndrome. Interesting fact about ARDS is it used to be called um, adult respiratory distress syndrome, but then they recognized that it can be found in adults and children. So they changed it to acute respiratory distress syndrome. So the diagnosis of ARDS, so there's a classic clinical diagnosis called the Berlin definition, and it must include acute onset. So it's acute respiratory distress syndrome. So it makes sense. The definition um, says acute. So begins within one week of a known clinical uh, insult. It has to be bilateral on both lungs, you see abnormalities, infiltrates. And so you can see those abnormalities on CAT scan. Um, and sometimes you can use chest X-ray and ultrasound, which we'll talk about too. So bilateral opacities present on chest radiograph or CT, they must not be explained by pleural effusions, lobar collapse, lung collapse, or pulmonary nodules. Okay, so these are, these are nodules that are not from um, effusions or CHF. The patient's respiratory failure must not be explained by cardiac failure, so not, not CHF. And then you have moderate to severe impairment of oxygenation. The problem in ARDS is oxygenation, okay? It's defined by the ratio of arterial oxygen tension to the fraction of inspired oxygen, the P to F ratio. This is what Dr. Banguti was mentioning, Dr. Pollan says the P to F ratio is less than 200. We have to have the PAO2 to calculate the P to F ratio. The PAO2 comes from an arterial blood gas, right? So if you don't have an ABG, we need to figure out how else we can diagnose ARDS. Let's assume for a second that we do have arterial blood gas analyses. If the F ratio is less than 300, you have mild ARDS. If it's less than 200, you have moderate ARDS. But if it's less than 100, you have severe ARDS, okay? So let's go back briefly. The diagnosis is ARDS. You saw that I clicked on that, that reference and it took me to, um, to up to date, okay? Up to date is something that we use, I use almost every single day when I'm caring for patients. You can see um, the title here and these search boxes, you can type in anything. And what UpToDate does is it reviews all of the evidence, all of the literature, et cetera. And it, and it tells you about the disease, how to diagnose it, how to treat it, et cetera. So it's very, very useful resource. Unfortunately, UpToDate requires a subscription. Um, in my setting, the subscriptions are often paid, paid for by the institution. For example, I work at a few different hospitals and my hospitals will pay for that subscription so that all of their doctors and nurses can use up to date. <clears throat> That's not always possible in, um, 
in variably resource settings. So if your institution has not paid for that, I would encourage you to get your institution to pay for it. But you can also see if you can qualify as an individual. And here's a link on the Learning Resource Center to see if you qualify. So you can sign up, especially if you live in a low and middle income country, to see if you can um, get this for free or reduced rates. So just something to know. Um, it is a useful resource that many of us use. Also important to know is that up to date during the COVID-19 pandemic has allowed free use of topics. So you can search anything about COVID, ARDS, anything related to the pandemic for free. I don't know when that ends, but you guys are welcome to try to use up to date and you'll see the free stuff versus they'll ask you for a payment for subscription. So um, not trying to say it's the only reference out there, but it is very useful. And if you can get it for free, then that's, that's great. Okay, here come the questions about what if we don't have an ABG? Okay, this is a very common question and a lot of places don't have arterial um, blood gas analyses. But before we answer that question, I wanna show you another maybe 20 second video about how inflammation affects the lung segments in ARDS. And you can see that this is an alveolus and you can see that this is the interstitium and within the interstitium you have these capillaries, okay? So oxygen doesn't have very far to go across the, the alveolus through the interstitium and then into that capillary. But when you have pulmonary edema with ARDS and inflammation, you'll see how far the oxygen has to go. So now we have inflammation, edema, and look at how, I'm gonna play it again. Look at how swollen this gets. So now oxygen has to go very, very far and can't reach that. So you have hypoxemia because of that. You have fluid filled alveolus too. So sometimes the oxygen doesn't even get into the alveolus because it's filled with fluid. So this is a diffusion problem of hypoxemia. Remember we talked about that. Okay. So here's the question everyone is asking, can ARDS be diagnosed when an arterial blood gas is not available? And the answer is yes. And we are very grateful to some of our colleagues in Rwanda who figured this out for us. So you can see Dr. Ajit and Tejin, Rob Fowler and Daniel Tomer work to figure out how to diagnose ARDS when you don't have an arterial blood gas. So I'm gonna go straight to this figure, which is a, sum a really nice summary because I don't wanna read the whole article because uh, just for the sake of time, and I clicked on the wrong thing, apologies. We'll click on this image here. So what these guys did is they compared the Berlin criteria and they made modifications for settings that don't have arterial blood gas analysis. So you can see the timing has to be acute. We said within one week. And that's the same. So the Berlin criteria versus the Kigali modification is the same. Oxygenation, remember to define the mild, moderate, and severe ARDS. You use the P to F ratio, which Dr. Pollan pointed out. So less than 300 is ARDS. Remember that's mild, and then you go into moderate, and then you go into severe. What the Kigali modification does is it uses pulse oximetry, S uh, SpO2 to FiO2 ratio. And if that's less than 315, you can say that you have um, an impact on oxygenation. When the Berlin criteria measures the P to F ratio, that arterial blood gas must be drawn on a patient that has at least five centimeters of water of PEEP or CPAP added. And for the Kigali modification, that's not necessary. Um, and the rest of it is, is mostly the same. Bilateral opacities, okay, seen on chest radiograph or CT. And the Kigali modification says chest radiograph or ultrasound. So if you don't have CAT scans, you can, um, you can use ultrasound or, or chest x-ray. And then the origin of the edema is the same. So timing, no modification, origin, no modification. But they reviewed all of this literature and validated that oxygenation can use SpO2 instead of PaO2 and it can be done without PEEP and that you can use chest radiograph or if you have ultrasound available, you don't have to have CT to make that diagnosis. So this is very, very useful for us um, when we don't have um, 
ABG. How do you measure the FiO2? Very good question. Can the rest of the audience determine how to measure FiO2? How would you measure FiO2? We've actually already answered this question. The fraction of inspired oxygen on room air is what? 21%. Then we talked about we can give oxygen by nasal cannula. Let me go back to that. Remember, we talked about different types of oxygen delivery devices, and this is what Dr. Sari is saying, depends on which um, uh, delivery device. So if you go back up here, it says these oxygen delivery devices, and it takes you to this explanation. If, you're, if your FiO2 determines on which oxygen delivery device you're using, if you're using a nasal cannula at five liters, then your FiO2 is 40%. If you're using an, a simple mask at 10 liters, then your FiO2 is 60%. If you're using a non-rebreather at 15 liters, then your FiO2 is 90 to 95%. If you're using a non-invasive positive pressure ventilation mask or a mechanical ventilator, you set the FiO2 on those machines. So you should be able to estimate what your FiO2 is. I think it's really important to recognize when you're calculating the P to F ratio that the F, the fraction of inspired oxygen, we often will explain it as a percentage such as 90% or 60%. But when you do the calculation, you do it as a percentage of one. So for example, 80% would be 0 0.8. So when you take your PaO2 to FiO2, it's the PaO2 value divided by 0.8 eight or 0.5 or whatever your percentage is. Similarly, if you're using the Kigali modification, you take your SpO2, so 100%, 90%, and you would divide that by whatever your FiO2 is using the zero point. Um, if you're on 100%, that it's 1.0. Hopefully that makes sense. Okay, so can ARDS be diagnosed when an arterial blood gas is not available? Yes. Okay, let's talk a little bit more about the P to F ratio. I want you to do this calculation and put your answer in the chat box. If Mr. S has an arterial partial pressure of oxygen equal to 60, this is in millimeters of mercury, 60 millimeters of mercury is his partial pr pressure of oxygen. PaO2 is 60. And his mechanical ventilator is set to deliver 80% oxygen. What is his P to F ratio? Remember, I, I said this is 80%, so you would put 0.8. So, Put your answer in the chat box. What is his P to F ratio? Okay, some of our bosses, Dr. Amos, Saria, Innocent. Perfect, everyone is saying 75. How did we get there? I'm gonna click on this question box and see what we can find. Ah, a calculator, look at this. This is from a resource called opencriticalcare.org. They have a lot of great resources and I'll share more with you at the end of the session. You can do oxygen saturation by pulse oximetry. Remember, this is part of the Kigali modification. And we said that it was 60% um, on PaO2, which is approximately 90% 90, 90 on pulse oximetry. And the FiO2, we said, was 80, isn't it? OK, so the P to F ratio is 75, 74, 75 which is correct. If you divide 60 by 0.8, you get 75. Perfect, Jackson, thank you. What a cause of Johnny. Okay, perfect. So his P to F ratio is 75. Is that mild, moderate, or severe ARDS? Yep. 
Yes, severe, 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 severe. Absolutely. So let's click on that again. It takes us back to up to date. Oh, I think it's telling me I'm using up to date too much. Um, but it, if it's less than three, if your P to F ratio is less than 300, you have mild. If it's less than 200, you have moderate. If it's less than 100, you have severe. So Mr. S has severe ARDS based on his P to F ratio or SpO2 to FiO2 ratio. All right, let's see how he's doing. Uh-oh, the nurse calls you stat. Mr. S is obtunded. Even with sternal rub, he won't wake up. She states he had recently received some lorazepam and hydromorphone for his anxiety and his difficulty breathing. His pulse oximeter reads 70 to 79%. His heart rate is 99 and his blood pressure is 98 over 54. She said he's making gurgling noises. This doesn't sound good. What, which of the following is the most appropriate next step? And I'm gonna step away for one minute and I'll be right back. Put your answer in the chat box. Which of the following is the most appropriate next step? Dr. Anna, your screen is frozen on the wrong slide. I think she might have stepped away. This is the question that Dr. Anna just asked. Oh, great, she's back. Dr. Anna, your screen was frozen on the wrong slide. So I shared where we're at and I'll hand it back over to you. Okay, sorry. Um, which of the following is the most appropriate next step for Mr. S? A trial of high flow nasal cannula at 40 liters per minute and 100% FiO2, a trial of non-invasive ventilation using BiPAP, uh, 15 over five, combined nasal cannula, six liters per minute with non-rebreather mask, 15 liters per minute, emergent intubation with mechanical ventilation, or no intervention is needed at this time. One, two, three, four, or five. The nurse calls you staff. Mr. S is obtunded and won't wake up even with, with sternal rub. She says that he um, recently received some medications. His oxygenation is now 70 to 79. He's making gurgling noises. Perfect. Everyone is saying answer number four, which I agree, emergent intubation and mechanical ventilation. So let's go through the other answers and understand them a little bit more. A trial of high flow nasal cannula could help with oxygenation, but when someone is obtunded, they're not protecting their airway and they probably are hypoventilating. And if you remember back to that diagram about hypoxemia, hypoventilation can lead to hypoxemia because you're not pulling enough air in. It also will likely lead to um, CO2 retention. So if you're not breathing, you're not having a gas exchange. 
So giving high flow oxygen is not going to solve the problem of, um, of, of breathing and ventilation. What about non-invasive ventilation using BiPAP? Again, this is a very high pressure that is applied through a mask to the airways. The airways have to be open and your patient has to be initiating a breath for that to get in. So if someone is obtunded and not breathing adequately and not protecting their airway, then they're not gonna be compliant with the mask. Also, they're gonna be at a very high risk of aspiration. So if they have any sort of secretions or emesis, all that pressure is gonna do is push it into their lungs. So you're gonna have a, a big problem with aspiration um, and inadequate ventilation. Again, you can, in hypoxemic patients, combine oxygen delivery devices, such as a nasal cannula plus a non-rebreather. And that is often done in purely hypoxemic patients. But again, this patient has a problem with oxygenation and ventilation. So we need to give them a higher level of support. No intervention needed at this time. If you chose that answer, your patient will probably die and you might feel bad. So emergent intubation and mechanical ventilation is the definite answer. Okay, I am gonna stop screen sharing for just a minute because we're about to get into mechanical ventilation, which I know can be challenging to understand um, sometimes for people. So I just wanna stop and check in with everyone and see how you're doing, if you have any questions before we get to mechanical ventilation. You can put it in the chat box, you can unmute. I'm very happy to see you all and have such a great audience. I'm used to doing panels where there's lots of teachers um, lately, but, um, but today it's just me talking. So sorry, you're probably bored of me already, but I hope you're learning something. What is base excess on an ABG? That's a very good question. So base excess means you have an excess amount of base. So it gives you some insight into your ability to compensate for an acidosis or not. So the normal pH is what? Normal pH for a human. So it's 7.35 to 7.45. That's the normal pH range for humans. And there are several different ways our bodies can compensate to keep that pH within a normal range. And the, the, why is it important to keep pH in a normal range? Do you guys remember in school you learned about enzymes? Yes? Enzymes are responsible for most of the functioning in our bodies. Almost everything is a, a type of enzymes. Our catecholamines, adrenaline, enzyme, okay? So all of these functions within our cells and our bodies are dependent upon enzymatic processes. Enzymatic processes only work within a certain pH and temperature range. That's why pH is so very important. If you fall outside of that range, your enzymes don't work. That means a lot of your cell processes don't work. So especially with, with acidosis, with low pH, um, you'll start to see problems in the cells and tissues of the body. Primarily, you'll start to see hemodynamic compromise. So you'll see people get hypotensive um, at severe acido acidosis. So in the ICU, we often will see pH uh, the lowest I've seen is probably 6.8, 6.9, very, very, very low. And at those levels, the patient, you can push a whole syringe of adrenaline and it will do nothing. You have to raise the, the, the pH in order for the adrenaline to work. So in severe acidosis, a lot of your bodies, remember your liver enzymes, cardiac enzymes, kidney function, all your cells use enzymes. So, um, having a very low pH or severe acidosis, all of those things stop working. So you start to have cell death, tissue death, organ dysfunction, eventually patient death. So base excess is, is one number that you can use in addition to the pH to determine the overall acid-base status of 
um, of the patient. And so it actually is not just pH, it goes back to bicarb, et cetera. But I'll talk a little bit more about ABGs um, at the end as well. So good, great question. Someone else wants to understand how to calculate the PaO2 to FiO2 ratio. Okay, the PaO2 is taken from your arterial blood gas. So you run an, an ABG, you get a little printout and it has the PaO2 on there, right? So the PaO2 comes from the ABG, okay? Then all you're gonna do is divide it by the FiO2, okay? So it's a ratio because we're not looking at the units, we're just looking at the ratio. So you don't say millimeters of mercury over percent. It's just two numbers, PaO2 divided by FiO2, okay? The PaO2, you have to have an arterial blood gas. The FiO2, you've either programmed it into your mechanical ventilator or you estimate it depending on which oxygen delivery device you have chosen, which we talked about. Like if you're using a nasal cannula at six liters, you can plug in the number versus a non-rebreather. Okay, great. So we'll keep going. And then at the end, if we have extra time, we'll continue to do just open questions so we can get, um, get everybody's uh, up to speed on understanding. Mechanical ventilation, can you see my screen? Or if you can't, tell me, because I, I can't see your faces anymore. Okay, mechanical ventilation. The first thing we wanna do is understand the basic modes of mechanical ventilation. We wanna understand measured versus set parameters. We on, want to understand how to improve oxygenation, especially in Mr. S who has ARDS. And we want to understand how to improve ventilation or CO2 elimination. And then finally, we want to understand which parameters we can use that, to, de, to determine whether our patients are improving or not. Okay. You made the right decision. You and your team decided to intubate and mechanically ventilate Mr. S for hypoxemic and hypercarbic respiratory failure. You want to place him on lung protective ventilation because he has a diagnosis of ARDS. Can you list basic modes of mechanical ventilation? Let's do this in the chat box. In the chat box, what are the basic modes of ventilation? PSV, which stands for pressure support ventilation. I don't know what ASV is, however. AC mode, PCV, which is pressure control ventilation, VC, volume control, PC, pressure control, SIMV, Synchronized intermittent mandatory ventilation, CPAP, continuous positive airway pressure, and PS is pressure support. Lots of abbreviations and letters, isn't there? Good. So those are all basic modes. Great. Okay. So let's go in a little bit more. I'm going to click on this box here which takes you to a slide deck about basic modes of ventilation. I'm gonna actually go back to the Learning Resource Center. When you create an account on the Learning Resource Center, all of this is available. You can come in here yourself and click on these boxes and get the articles, get the videos, get the resources. I wanna point out something that you may or may not have noticed on the Learning Resource Center. Do you see this paperclip icon up here in the top right-hand corner? You can click on that icon and you can see that I have uploaded these slides. So when you're on the Learning Resource Center, you can click on this and you can download my slides on basic mechanical ventilation. Okay, so you can see I'm uploading here. I'm gonna open this in PowerPoint actually, but you can also click on the box and get it within, um, within the Learning Resource Center. So when you open it up in PowerPoint, you can see that I have made all of these notes for you about each slide. So as you go through the slides, you can actually see what I'm trying to demonstrate, okay? So you can download these PowerPoint slides yourself. Alternatively, you can go in the LRC, click on the box, 
and it will take you to this resource here and you can just click through the slides on the Learning Resource Center. So there's a lot of different ways to teach mechanical ventilation. I'm gonna teach it to you the way that I learned it because it, I learned it many, many different ways before it finally clicked in my brain as to how to, how to understand the very basics. So this is very fundamental um, concepts for mechanical ventilation. With mechanical ventilation, I like to divide it into um, two, two broad divisions. You have control modes and you have support modes. When you are using a support mode, your patient is breathing spontaneously. This means your patient has their own respiratory rate. So imagine I'm breathing, I generate my own rate in and out of my lungs, okay? I'm breathing spontaneously. And the, these modes can be used oftentimes with a mask, like a CPAP or BiPAP or bi-level mask, but they can also be applied to an endotracheal tube using a mechanical ventilator. So support modes can be, can be given different ways, but they have to be used in a spontaneously breathing patient. The patient is generating their own breath and you're actually applying support. Support modes include pressure support, CPAP, and PEEP. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in just a minute. So you can apply support modes to spontaneously breathing patients, often using pressure or control modes. In control modes, you set a rate. You tell the machine to give a breath, okay? Can your patient be breathing spontaneously? Yes. Do they have to be? No. The machine can do everything for the patient or assist the patient, okay? So in control modes, you have to set some sort of rate. It can be a high rate or a low rate. It depends on the patient's needs. In control modes, you set a respiratory rate. In support modes, the patient's breathing spontaneously. You support them, but they, they set their own rate. When you're using a control mode, you are setting a rate which tells the machine to give a breath you can give that breath using volume, 400 milliliters, or you can give that breath using pressure, 25 centimeters of water. Okay, so let's look into that a little bit more closely. We're gonna start with the control modes because that's what we really think about when we talk about basic modes of mechanical ventilation. Remember I said in a control mode, you set a rate and you tell that machine to give a breath. So it is required that you set the respiratory rate. Remember, you can give that breath using volume or you can give that breath giving pressure. And you can see this is a volume breath and this is a pressure breath, okay? There are two very common types of control modes, assist control and synchronized intermittent mandatory ventilation or SIMV. So AC, Assist control, also Anna Crawford, um, gives a ventilator breath at the set rate. So if you set your rate at 15 breaths per minute, the machine will give 15 breaths per minute. But remember with control modes, the patient can also breathe, right? They don't always breathe, but they can. So if your patient is breathing 20, but you set the rate at 15, this in assist control, the ventilator will give those 15 breaths but also give a full mechanical ventilator breath for the additional breaths that the patient initiates. So it will give, if it's set at 15, but the patient's breathing 20, that patient will receive 20 ventilator breaths. The machine can detect when the patient starts to breathe and it will give an additional mechanical ventilator breath. That's assist control. Synchronized intermittent mandatory ventilation. If you set the rate at 15, that patient will receive those 15 ventilator breaths. But what if the patient breathes at 20? That patient will only receive 15 breaths per minute. So with synchronized intermittent mandatory ventilation, if you set a rate and your patient breathes more than that, they're breathing on their own for those additional breaths. However, in assist control, if your patient breathes more than that, they still get a full breath from the ventilator. This is the big difference between assist control and SIMV. 
With assist control, you can imagine that because that ventilator is giving a breath, giving a breath, giving a breath, giving a breath, that it can sometimes cause dyssynchrony with the patient's efforts. So assist control is really used in patients who need maximal support. And oftentimes these patients are heavily sedated, sometimes paralyzed in severe ARDS. So that's the big difference between assist control and SIMB. Okay. I'm going to stop sharing for just a second and check this chat box out that I see has a lot of uh, a lot of addition. Okay, great. You guys, you guys have all these basic modes. So now we know support modes. Patients breathing on their own. You're just giving them some extra pressure, which we're about to talk about. But control modes. SIMV, assist control. Sometimes you'll see CMV, which means controlled mechanical ventilation. Those are control modes of mechanical ventilation. You set a rate, okay? The patient may breathe over that rate. If they breathe over that rate in assist control, they get a full breath. If they breathe over that rate in SIMV, they only get that rate that you set. They don't get any more support for the extra breaths, okay? So let's go back now and let's talk about support modes. Remember, support modes, your patient's breathing spontaneously. All you're gonna do is support their breathing by adding pressure. The types of pressure you can add is pressure support, CPAP, and PEEP. So what are the differences? Oops, sorry, I went backwards. Pressure support adds pressure during inspiration. Remember when we breathe, I made you all take a big deep breath. We can do it again if you want. Take a big deep breath. You are generating negative pressure inside your chest and you're pulling air into your lungs. The ventilator, when you're connected to a circuit on the ventilator can detect when the patient pulls, okay? And you can see there's flow and there's pressure and it goes negative. That negative, value is the patient pulling, pulling air into their lungs. The ventilator can detect that's the start of inspiration. When the ventilator detects that start of inspiration, it knows it's time to apply pressure support, okay? And pressure support can be set at whatever you wanna set it to, five, 10, 20. It's triggered by the start of inspiration and it only lasts during inspiration. Similarly to the ventilator being able to detect when flow is going into the patient, they can also detect when that flow stops. So it will apply pressure until that flow stops from the patient and then it takes the pressure off. That's pressure support. What is PEEP? PEEP is positive end expiratory pressure. This is a continuous pressure applied to the patient throughout the respiratory cycle. PEEP is applied because it actually actually is, uh, has its impact at the, end of, um, at the end of exhalation. So if we all take a big deep breath in and we blow it out or allow it to come out, at the very end of exhalation is when tiny alveoli, especially in the periphery and dependent zones, start to collapse. If you add pressure at the end of exhalation, it will prevent that collapse. It will help prevent atelectasis of the alveoli. And that's really important for getting that oxygen in. So it really has a big impact on oxygenation. So positive end expiratory pressure is constant. It's always there and the patient will breathe over it. But at the end of exhalation, PEEP will prevent that negativity at the end of exhalation. So it, it puts a little bit of back pressure on those alveoli, preventing them from collapsing and allowing them to continue to participate in oxygenation, okay? So PEEP can be added, this is important, to any mode of ventilation. It can be added to control modes, it can be added to support modes, it can be added to um, SIMV, it can be added to AC. It's just a constant pressure, but it has its greatest effect at the end of exhalation because it prevents those alveoli from collapsing. That's PEEP. So what is um, bi-level? Pressure support plus PEEP is bi-level. BiPAP is actually a little bit of a misnomer. It's a brand name, I think, by Philips. So bi-level is the proper term when you have pressure support plus PEEP. Okay. 
So how does this work? Remember, this is a support mode. Your patient's breathing spontaneously. They're breathing in, they're breathing out. The ventilator can tell when they're breathing in. It can tell when they're breathing out, right? So as the patient breathes in, we're gonna apply pressure support, okay? That's gonna augment their tidal volume and augment um, their, their breath. PEEP is present throughout. So when the patient inspires, pressure support is added, okay? But PEEP is always there. So as they expire, they have PEEP present to prevent the closure of alveoli, okay? They're added together during inspiration. You see PEEP is always there, but during inspiration, you add that pressure support. So actually during inspiration, this patient is seeing a pressure of 10 and during exhalation, they're only seeing five, okay? So five of pressure support plus five of PEEP. Okay, this is bi-level. CPAP is continuous positive airway pressure. It's actually really similar to PEEP in that it's always there. But what happens is when we breathe in, we generate negative pressure. And what the support mode of CPAP does is it, it during that negative pressure, it actually applies flow and pressure so that you can't actually generate negative, okay? And what that does is it acts as an airway stent and holds everything open. Okay, so you can see it's very similar to CPAP, but as you raise that pressure, it's always positive. It's continuously positive airways pressure. Okay, so it's a positive pressure applied continuously. It requires very high flows and prevents inspiratory pressures from falling below expiratory levels. This prevents larger airways collapsing. Okay. This is the very basics of mechanical ventilation, okay? So the basic modes of ventilation, how would you list those again now? You have control modes, you have AC and SIMV. Then you have support modes. You have BiPAP or bi-level, you have CPAP and you have pressure support and PEEP, okay? In the support modes, your patient's breathing spontaneously. You're just using different types of pressure to augment their oxygenation and ventilation. In control modes, your patient may have a spontaneous rate, but they really need help from the ventilator to get the breath in and out, okay? So that can be given with SIMV or um, assist control. All right, having heard all of that, instead of you asking me a question, I'm gonna ask you a question. I'm gonna pull up the chat box and you guys are gonna take a test. Everybody's favorite thing to do, take a test. Okay, there's only five questions. Question number one, which of the following options is correct? The FiO2 or fraction of inspired oxygen the patient is breathing is determined by their respiratory rate. Correct or not correct? In volume control ventilation, the peak inspiratory pressure is constant. In volume control ventilation, the respiratory rate depends entirely upon the patient's effort. Or number, the last one, PEEP can be applied to any mode of ventilation. Which of these is correct? Put it in the chat box, please. We'll give you 30 seconds. Okay, so most people said it's the last option. I didn't give you numbers or letters. So um, some people said four or D. So PEEP can be applied to any mode of ventilation. That's absolutely correct. But that means these others are incorrect. So let's talk about each one of these. So the fraction of inspired oxygen, the patient is breathing is determined by their respiratory rate. Sorry, no. 
The fraction of inspired oxygen or FiO2 is a parameter on the mechanical ventilator that must be set by the provider. You set the FiO2, not your patient, okay? What about this one? Volume control. The peak inspiratory pressure is constant. This is not correct. The peak inspiratory pressure or PIP, or sometimes we say PIP, is the highest pressure measured during inspiration. It depends on compliance of the respiratory system, including airways, lung parenchyma, chest wall, and abdominal pressure. So compliance changes. The airways can change, the lung parenchyma can change, the abdominal pressure can change, the chest wall can change. That means compliance can change. If you're develop, delivering the same tidal volume in volume control ventilation, that pressure is going to change depending on compliance. It's not going to be constant. What about volume control ventilation and the respiratory rate? Is it dependent upon the patient's effort? Volume control is a control mode. This means the respiratory rate is set by the provider. Can the patient breathe above or below that? Yes, but the respiratory rate is not entirely dependent on patient effort because we program in a respiratory rate. So the correct answer is D or four, the last one. PEEP or positive end expiratory pressure can be applied to any mode of ventilation. Okay, that was question one, four more to go. This is easy, true or false? Okay, support modes are used in spontaneously breathing patients, meaning the respiratory rate is set by the patient's spontaneous effort. True or false? Good job. Everybody says true, I love it, perfect. That's correct, well done. Next question, which of the following options is incorrect, so not correct? First option, control modes require the provider set a respiratory rate on the ventilator machine. Control modes can deliver each breath using a set tidal volume. Control modes can deliver each breath using a set inspired pressure. CPAP is a control mode of ventilation. Which of the following is incorrect? Great, you guys are doing awesome. You're almost getting an A. All right, control mode. So, that, so if CPAP is, a, is not a control mode of ventilation, that means it's a support mode of ventilation. So this statement is incorrect, but that means that these first three options are cor correct. So control modes require the provider set a respiratory rate because it's a control mode. It can deliver breath using set tidal volume or set inspired pressure. Perfect. All right, next question, almost done. Which one of the following interventions is most appropriate? Increasing PEEP for hypoxemic patients, increasing FiO2 for COPD patients with elevated PaCO2, decreasing the respiratory rate for a patient with metabolic acidosis, or using CPAP in a patient with apnea. Which one is most appropriate? Okay, you guys are doing wonderful. So A or one. So the most appropriate intervention is if you have a hypoxemic patient, you can use PEEP to improve uh, hypoxemia. Remember PEEP is positive end expiratory pressure. It, it has its effect at the end of expiration, preventing alveoli from collapse and decreasing atelectasis, allowing those alveoli to stay open and improve oxygen. Oxygenation. So that's absolutely correct. Okay, increasing FiO2 for a COPD patient with elevated PaCO2, that's incorrect. CO2 will not be eliminated more efficiently when you increase FiO2. It has no effect, okay? Decreasing respiratory rates for patients with metabolic acidosis. We talked a little bit about acidosis and base excess. Acidosis is associated with a lower pH. 
pH or a decrease in pH, if you decrease the respiratory rate, carbon dioxide goes up, that makes your pH go down even further, resulting in a worse respiratory acidosis. So this is absolutely incorrect. Again, CPAP in apnea patients is ineffective and will not help your patient at all. If a patient is apneic, they need bag mask ventilation until they can get intubated and mechanically ventilated. CPAP is a support mode. Remember the, that you don't set a rate on the ventilator. So if your patient's not breathing and you apply a mask with pressure, that patient is not gonna get a breath. So apnea patients need that respiratory rate in a control mode on a mechanical ventilator, okay? so. Um, the correct option is the first one, PEEP or FiO2 improve oxygenation in most patients. Good job. Last question. A patient is on bi-level support ventilation. Pressure support is set at 10 centimeters of water. PEEP is set at 5 centimeters of water. Which one of the following statements is correct? The inspiratory pressure is 15. The rate is 15. Increasing PEEP will increase the FiO2. <clears throat> Bi-level is useful in apneic patients. So which of these statements is correct? Great, everyone's doing such a good job. Everybody's answering the first one. So again, inspiratory pressure so during inspiration, remember PEEP is always there at five, but if you add pressure support, that, is, that occurs also doing, during inspiration. So during expiration, the pressure should be five. During inspiration, you would add the five plus the 10, so inspiratory pressure is 15. So that's the correct answer. The rate is 15, you're on bi-level. This is a support mode. You're not setting a rate. The patient's breathing spontaneously. So the respiratory rate is determined by the patient. Increasing the PEEP will increase the FiO2? No. Increasing the FiO2 will increase the FiO2. Bi-level is not useful on apneic patients. Just like with CPAP, if your patient's not breathing spontaneously, you can't use a support mode. You have to use a control mode. They need help from the ventilator. You all get an A plus 100%. Perfect. Uh-oh, we have another test. We went from one test to another one. Okay, so this one, we're gonna talk about ventilator parameters and we're gonna identify set parameters. That means you set these parameters versus measured parameters, what the ventilator is measuring. Okay, this is an important concept because you have to distinguish between the two to understand whether your prescription for mechanical ventilation is appropriate following parameters, the mode of ventilation, the tidal volume set by the provider, the tidal volume measured, the respiratory rate set by the provider, the respiratory rate measured, and the set peak. Okay, we're going to replay this and pause it. Okay, so in this video, I ask you to identify things on a real ventilator. This is a picture of a ventilator at Shayashika. You may recognize this mind ray. You can see when you're on the Learning Resource Center, these little ones that tell you that you can click on these different parts of the screen, okay? And I ask you to identify some of these parameters, okay? Some are set. Some are measured. So let's listen again, and I want you to, as we go through the video, click on the video to identify the Okay, the basic mechanical ventilation. <clears throat> if you look here, you can see this VAC. It says assist. Click on that. The mode of ventilation is VCAC or volume control assist control. This is assist control and it's delivering the breath using volume. Remember, the mechanical ventilator, you can use volume or you can use pressure. Control assist control. Each breath will be delivered using the tidal volume set by the provider. 
the number of breaths will include the set rate and any additional patient triggered breaths. Remember with assist control, if your patient breathes above the set rate, and SIMV where they only get mixed and then they breathe on their own, okay? So you can, um, you can see the mode is up in this top left-hand corner, but also notice at the bottom of the ventilator, do you see this panel of buttons at the bottom? You see VAC here. This is volume assist control here too. One thing I want you to recognize on mechanical ventilators, and it gets confusing because there's lots of different types of ventilators and they're all a little bit different. But one thing to recognize is that typically there's a panel that shows you your settings, what you set, the parameters that are set by the provider. Then there's also usually another panel. If you see this panel here on the right, these are Also see it down here. This is where you actually set it. So you set it here and the ventilator says, yeah, this is what I sense, okay? So let's keep playing the video and see what else we can learn. The tidal volume set by the provider. Okay, now I'm asking you to identify the tidal volume as set by the, by the provider. Remember, set parameters are down here. This is where you go into the ventilator and you program what you want. And you can see right here, TV, that's tidal volume, and it says 90 milliliters. That may seem low to you, but if you were paying close attention, you would notice this is a pediatrics patient. You see the little baby, okay? So let's click here. Tidal volume set. The provider sets the tidal volume here. The tidal volume is set at 90 milliliters for this patient. So these are set parameters. These are measured parameters. Okay, what's next? The tidal volume measured the tidal volume measured the tidal volume set and remember measured parameters are in this other panel the tidal volume measured look here the tve is tidal volume exhaled this is how the, the ventilator knows what actually went into and out of the patient tve means they measure the volume exhaled by the patient and you can see it's 67 so let's click on that Tidal volume measured, it's displayed as VTE for exhaled tidal volume. It should approximate the tidal volume that is set on the ventilator in a volume control mode. In this example, the tidal volume is set at 90 and measured at 67, okay? The respiratory rate set by the provider. Okay, I said set, not measured. So we go in as providers and we put in our ventilator settings in this bottom panel. You can see F here. So when you talk about the respiratory rate, the breaths per minute, it's also sometimes called the frequency. So F is frequency and you can see the number 25. This is the respiratory rate that is set by the provider. It is set to 25 breaths per minute, okay? I bet you can anticipate what I'm gonna ask next. The respiratory rate measured. Okay, the respiratory rate measured. F total, BPM, 33. Measured respiratory rate. Respiratory rate that is measured by the ventilator. Although the set rate is 25, this patient is actually breathing 33 breaths per minute. So remember, we said in assist control, you can set the rate, but if your patient breathes over, they get a full ventilator breath. So even though we set the rate at 25, this baby is breathing 33. They get 33 mechanical ventilator breaths, 30 times 90 milliliters, okay? They get, the, they get that volume breath, 33. And the set peep. The set peep. Remember settings are down here. On the video okay. to identify the following. So hopefully this is um, helpful for you. Again, you can access all of this on your own. It's free, it's open access. You just create an account. You can go through this activity on your own. So identifying set parameters on that bottom column and then measured parameters on that right side of the screen. 
But remember, there's lots of different ventilators and they're all very different, okay? So we'll go through another exercise in just a minute. But next I wanna know from you, what is lung protective ventilation? So Jean Lenard, if you wanna see this content, you need to create an account on the Learning Resource Center and you can access all of this for free. Everything we've talked about is available to you. You can, everything I'm showing you on the screen, you can have, it's my gift to you. So create an account on the LRC and you can have all of this. It works on your phone, it works on a computer, it works on Apple, it works on Android. You can have all of these things. Okay, now in the chat box, tell me, what is lung protective ventilation? What does that mean? Even one person can answer. Great, thank you, Dr. Amos. Okay. So it's a little bit difficult to define, you know, some other questions everybody answers right away, but now it's kind of people are thinking, what is lung protective? Why do we call it lung protective ventilation? Because historically we have given um, people support using mechanical ventilators, but then we realize that maybe we're actually causing more harm than good. And the things that have been identified as causing harm and, and, and lung damage, so by harm, I mean we're damaging the patient's lungs using these ventilators. The things we've identified that cause damage include high pressures, high levels of oxygen, and then um, high volumes, so stretching, and then opening and closing. So barotrauma, volume trauma, um, adelect trauma, all of these things are called biotrauma. So all, all of these things, too much stretch, too much pressure, opening and closing, cause alveoli and lung tissues to have additional damage to the cells and additional inflammation. Even too high of oxygen, as we mentioned, hyperoxia can cause lung damage, can cause cellular damage. So now what we try to do is protect the lungs um, using different strategies on the mechanical ventilator. So let's dive into this. What is lung protective ventilation? Let's click on that and see what resource I shared with you. Oh, wow, look at this. I'm gonna close the chat box for a second so I can't see your comments, apologies. But look at all of this information. This is a very good resource that you should download onto your phone, print it out, whatever you need to do. It's on the LRC. So if you ask me, how do I get it? It's on the Learning Resource Center. I'll show you again. But if you look here, it's a respiratory card in a pocket reference. You can also scan this code and download it straight to your phone, okay? But this is a guide for how to set up mechanical ventilators for your patients. And if you see here in this green section, it says lung protective ventilation. All ARDS patients and most patients, so it's not just ARDS, it's most intubated patients on mechanical ventilation will benefit from lung protective ventilation. Though there are some instances where it's not justified, but most patients will. Oh, look at this card. It defines the Berlin definition of ARDS with the Kigali modification. So if you can't remember off the top of your head how to diagnose ARDS, here you go. Also for pediatric patients. Well, how do I remember if it's mild, moderate, or severe? Look, here it is. P to F less than 300, 200, 100. Mild, moderate, severe, okay? How do I set the tidal volume? How do I set the pressures? How do I set the respiratory rate? How do I set the PEEP? Okay, all of that information is here. So when we talk about lung protective ventilation, we don't wanna overstretch the lungs and we don't want our pressures too high. So if you look here, the ideal tidal volume is four to six milliliters per kilogram. This is predicted body weight. You may not see it very often, but in the United States, we have very, very big patients, very obese. 
just because someone is obese doesn't mean that their lungs get bigger. So you don't give them very large tidal volumes, even if they may be very, very big. You give them tidal volumes based on their predicted or ideal body weight. Um, I just yesterday finished seven, seven days in a row in the intensive care unit here in California. And I had a patient that had the highest BMI I've ever seen, and it was 74. So very, very, very big patient. But when you do predicted body weight, you use gender and height. So because she was very short, she's very big, but she's very short, her tidal volumes were still four to six milliliters per kilogram, okay? So you measure the height and you calculate the predicted body weight. You can also look at this table and there are many, many calculators online to help you with predicted body weight, okay? When we talk about pressures, the goal in mechanical ventilation is to keep your plateau pressure less than 30, okay? If your plateau pressure is higher than that, then you start to worry about barotrauma, okay? So we can talk a little bit more about that. Respiratory rate is really to help you with your pH, okay? We want to get rid of CO2 to optimize our pH for all those reasons we talked about, the enzymatic processes. And then PEEP and FiO2 are the two parameters that you use to improve oxygenation. So you can, you can use this table to titrate up or titrate down your FiO2 and PEEP, okay? So I'm not gonna go into incredible detail because this, this card is a lecture in and of itself, but when you're talking about lung protective ventilation, it's recognizing that you need to use lowered tidal volumes, four to six milliliters per kg. And then you also need to pay attention to your pressures so that you don't cause barotrauma, okay? Let me glance at the chat box. Okay, um, we'll have open questions at the end. So I'll get back to you on that. Melundu, Moifa, Moifa, okay. For the image below, okay, here's another activity for you to engage. For the image below, present the mechanical ventilator settings as if presenting on ICU daily team rounds. So I'm gonna show you a picture of a ventilator, okay? And I want you to present, I'm your attending. We are rounding in the intensive care unit and I want you to tell me about this patient. You say, this patient's on mechanical ventilation. So I want you to present on rounds. How would you present this information on rounds? So I'll give you two minutes for this because it's a little bit more complicated. Okay, go, put it in the chat box. How would you present this on rounds? This is Mr. S, you know, he's a, a male, comes in COVID positive, acute hypoxic respiratory failure, found to have ARDS, now intubated, sedated on mechanical ventilation. His mechanical ventilation settings are Somebody <laughs> put it in the chat box. Okay, I will tell you the answer since nobody is brave enough to present this patient on rounds. Oh, good, thank you. Somebody's coming in with some answers. Maybe it's my internet may be slow. ACVC mode. Okay, so Mr. S is on intubated, sedated, on mechanical ventilation using assist control, volume control, so ACVC, okay? You can also see this C up here means a controlled breath was given. His FiO2 is 60%. His tidal volume is 330. His PEEP is set at 40. 
and his rate is set at 34. So remember, so this is a ventilator from my intensive care unit, okay? So this is how you would do it. You would do mode, you would do FiO2. So I'll just type it here, mode, then FiO2, okay? Then PEEP, I wanna know PEEP because this is a, an ARDS patient, okay? I wanna know his rate and I wanna know his tidal volume for sure. Those are definite things you should include on rounds, okay? So if I were presenting this patient, Patient, I would say he's on mechanical ventilation, assist control, volume control. His, his tidal volume is 330 because I want to say this is long protected ventilation. Is this four to six milliliters per ideal body weight? And so 330 is his tidal volume. Then I want to know how much oxygen and PEEP is he requiring? When you have ARDS, it's a problem with oxygenation. So I want to know he's on an FiO2 of 60% and a PEEP of 14. Okay. And then his rate it's gonna be set based on his ventilation needs and acid-based acid status. So his rate is 34, okay? There are others, so again, this is a ventilator from my intensive care unit. You can see the settings down, are down here. The measured parameters are up here. And then you can see some waveforms in the middle. So as a measurement, he's assist control. I have his rate set at 34, right? He's breathing 34. Okay, he's not over breathing the vent at all. I set his tidal volume at 330. This last breath was 332. I have his PEEP set at 14, but it's measured at 15, okay? And then you can see the peak inspiratory pressure here and the mean pressures here, okay? Very good, we're getting close to the end. We're almost done, A couple more questions. Which two ventilator parameters improve oxygenation? Which two ventilator parameters improve ventilation or CO2? So I need you to type in the chat box. Two parameters you use to improve oxygenation, two parameters you use um, to improve acid base and carbon dioxide. So oxygenation, let's start with that one. FiO2 and PEEP, perfect. What two parameters, oxygenation, PEEP, FiO2, perfect, perfect, perfect. What about ventilation? What about carbon dioxide and pH? How do we make those better? Tidal volume and respiratory rate, perfect. Very, very good. Okay, so if you wanna improve oxygenation, you adjust your PEEP and your FiO2. If you wanna improve carbon dioxide elimination and therefore improve your pH, you adjust tidal volume and respiratory rate. Very good. Mr. S was successfully intubated without difficulty and now is receiving sedation and mechanical ventilation. His current ventilator settings are ACVC, FiO2 of 60% and a PEEP of 14, oxygenation, respiratory rate of 34 and a tidal volume of 330, ventilation. His peak inspiratory pressure is 37. His plateau pressure is 25. His current vital signs are temperature of 36.5, a heart rate of 92, non-invasive blood pressure. I put NIBP because sometimes we have arterial lines. So then I would put um, ABP, okay? So when I'm using a blood pressure cuff, it's non-invasive blood pressure, 124 over 52. And his pulse oximeter is now reading 97, which is fine, okay? What is the driving pressure? We haven't talked about this yet. Let's go ahead and click on the box since we're running out of time or we're already out of time. I've, I've talked too much, I think. And go to the driving pressure. Let's see, respiratory mechanics. Ah, here it is, driving pressure. Pressure driving PDR, okay? PDR is the plateau pressure minus the P. It tells you how much stress you're putting on the lungs. So lung injury and mortality risk is elevated if your driving pressure is too high, okay? The target driving pressure is less than 15. If it's greater than that, you have an associated increased risk of mortality. So some of this is, uh, is because of the compliance of the lungs 
themselves. So if your lungs are non-compliant, your pressures are going to be high. And so you may have a hard time delivering those breaths and maintaining lower pressures. But there are definitely things that we can adjust on the ventilator to decrease our driving pressure. So we can decrease our tidal volumes. We can and also increase our PEEP, okay? So these things might help our driving pressures. So you guys are doing calculations, which is great. So if his plateau pressure is 25 and his PEEP is 14, 25 minus 14 is actually the driving pressure, okay? So if you have a, if you have a plateau pressure, that's more accurate than using the, the peak inspiratory pressure. Okay, so let's move on. So his is well below 15, it's 11, which is good, okay? So, and that's, these, just to tell you, I took this picture here yesterday. So this is a real patient's ventilator and these are real uh, numbers. So this is how I managed a patient with COVID-19 and ARDS just yesterday, okay? So the last thing we wanted to accomplish with today's um, meeting was so that you can know your resources. We've had a lot of questions about ABG interpretation. I showed you that respiratory card. I also mentioned that there's a lot of different types of ventilators. So I want to share with you just some resources. I talked to you about opencriticalcare.com or .org rather. If you go to this website, it has a lot of resources for you. They have clinical guidelines. They have a dashboard that tells you how to manage COVID-19. Remember that calculator that I used for determining the P to F ratio? They have calculators for lots of different things, including oxygen supply of a facility. So how much oxygen does your hospital need to serve all the patients? And then if you look here, this is that respiratory quick care reference. So this is where you can see that card. And then they have some other um, uh, resources as well. So I'm going to close that and go back here. So that's opencriticalcare.com. If you're on the LRC, you can click here or you can go directly to their website. If you need help determining how to set up your ventilator or how to use a ventilator that you've never seen before, you can try to use this Ventilator Training Alliance. It's online and there's also an app and it tells you how to operate ventilators. So if you go to that website, it takes a second to load, apologies. You can go over here to ventilators and choose any type of ventilator on the market. So if you have a Gradient Health Systems ventilator, you have a Medtronic, here's that mind ray ventilator that we have um, at Shea Oshiko. It has different types of mind rays. You can click on this and you can actually get information about that specific ventilator. So how do I turn it on? How do I set it up? How do I change parameters? So that's the Ventilator Training Alliance. And again, they have an app so you can use it on your phone. If you wanna do a deeper dive and take a, an actual mechanical ventilator course, Harvard University has this MedEx course, which is great. And through July, because of COVID, it's free, okay? So you can take this course and there are several different videos talking about how to interpret waveforms, how to set up a ventilator, the, just the basics, and then also how to ventilate ARDS patients, et cetera. If you learn best by simulation, you can go to Open Pediatrics. Open Pediatrics has this really great simulator for um, mechanical ventilators. So you can look at this vent sim simulator, change the parameters and see what happens. So you can play with the ventilator without playing with the patient. Um, so that's really good too. Um, looks like it takes a second to load as well. Okay, so that's Open Pediatrics. And then lastly, a reminder that on the Learning Resource Center, although we're talking about or oxygenation and ventilation today, we have several courses on the LRC that we have built for you, for our learners. And we try to combine evidence-based, really high yield resources. So some of the questions today are around ABGs. So I, I compiled those links for you today. And we have a page called Interpretation of Arterial Blood Gases. The American Thoracic Society has put out an article. There's some practice using ABG ninjas. Um, there's some great infographics with the St. Joseph's Healthcare. And one thing that I really like to use um, every day really in practice is this uh, site called MD Calc. You can also get that on your phone. And not only does it do blood gas analysis, it does just about anything. You can talk about all different types of calculators. So you can actually plug in your values here and, uh, and it'll interpret your ABG for you. So you wanna 
understand how it comes to those calculations, but if you want a quick, uh, a quick help with the calculations, you can use that calculator. So again, all of these things are on the Learning Resource Center. This is one module, this oxygenation and ventilation that we talked about up today is one module within a course, and there are several courses on the LRC. All of this is free to you. Things that you can download from this module, we talked about the slides about basic mechanical ventilation, and then also here's that respiratory pocket card. You can download it here off the LRC. You can also download it from opencriticalcare.com or .org. And let me look at the chat box really quickly. Perfect, thank you, Sarah. Okay, now we are way over time by a half an hour. I, I talk too much, I teach too much. Um, so if you have some last minute questions, I'm happy to answer those, but um, maybe about 10 more minutes and then uh, we'll log off. So any questions? Thank you for attending. I hope you learned something. I hope this was useful. I hope you understand that the Learning Resource Center has been built for you, all learners all over the globe. Um, also, feel free to share it with people that don't know about it that you think may like it. It's built for all types of providers, medical students, nurses, physicians, anesthesia, not anesthesia, ICU, emergency medicine. It's built for all of you. Um, so feel free to share it as a resource. It's free. Thank you very much, Anna. We appreciate uh, this uh, great tutorial. It has been long, but uh, useful and uh, uh, gave, full of information. Dr. Pollan, you gave me many topics to cover. I did, I did my best to make it short, but, but it's difficult. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know, I, I know, but, um, and I'm, we are very satisfied about the presentation. Uh, it was long, it was a very long session. Oxygenation ventilation is a very long topic. It can take a semester. Yeah teaching you no. actually you try to you try to summarize and we know you can't exhaust it you can't it can't be finished even if i know i'm sure if i give it to another consultant on this group to give us something you will have something new to add on and add on and add on because oxygen is because in tell people that uh, the learning resource course uh, the learning resource uh, course is a good platform, LRC. You can register. The all reference have been given here. You can register and start following all the courses free of charge yourself. You have an account. You can download many resources which you can print and even um, uh, post in your hospitals because uh, many hospitals uh, need those uh, algorithms to, to also show to others and to uh, remind to, to remind very quick when you need which tool to use for which FIO2. Those are things you need to make familiar in your center. So thank you very much. We don't. I don't want to take it and, and again longer. And we should go. Yeah, <laughs> I agree. I agree. So now, uh, just to announce to you that uh, uh, in the seri oxygen series, uh, Anna is another topic. When is it, Anna? Which what was the question? The next uh, oxygen series. Next Monday. Monday. Next Monday, uh, the twenty second, and I think it's twenty two, and, and we will be discussing um, non invasive uh, positive pressure ventilation and high flow oxygen therapy. So high flow nasal cannula and non invasive positive pressure. Uh, Monday, it's uh, twenty two. Okay. It's at the same okay, time, we'll, same time. We will see how to split the audience because uh, it may conflict with some of our program in, uh, in uh, the residency program, but uh, we will see how to split the audience and other people will follow this. We will announce both and uh, we'll see how to split the audience. And um, so you are welcome wherever you, uh, whenever you have time, join us on the LCR, uh, LRC and uh, learn some more critical care practice. 
So thank you very much, Anna, and uh, see you uh, next month for some and maybe a next opportunity for others. Thank you to the whole audience, and we appreciate your attendance. Yes, the topic will be uh, at the same time next Monday. With more people speaking, not just my head, other people too. Okay. We enjoy you speaking alone. It was great, Anna. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. What I appreciate the, it. What is the okay. DRC English? My Pardon? friend Patricia. Okay. I'll see you all again. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye bye.